Good morning, and welcome to worship at St. Paul's United Church of Christ in Woodstock, Virginia. No matter who you are or where you are on your life's journey, you are welcome here. I thank you for participating in this worship service virtually, and I sure look forward to seeing you in person. If you're a visitor, please come back when we are able to see you in person. I wanted to remind everybody about the repurposing workshop, which is happening this Saturday, on, which is February the 20th from 10 to 3. It will be an online workshop, and anyone who is interested in helping us to kind of refocus our vision and mission in a post-pandemic world is welcome to attend. Please call the church office if you can do so. I wanted to also give thanks today for our children who participated and really gave us our anthem. As usual, they are incredibly cute and um, we're grateful to them and to Patty um, Snar and Mary Catlett for leading them. I want to also thank Mary for her selection of the hymns. Thanks to Becky Litton for reading our scripture today. And just to note that in the service, you will see a brief video that is created by Hoffman Homes. Hoffman Homes is one of the uh, ministries that our church has partnered with in the past. And this year, we would have had something in person if we could have. But we have this video, which is incredibly well done. Please enjoy it as part of our service. And so as we begin to worship, I would ask that you would join with me in prayer. Holy God, the darkness and dreariness of winter has been our companion, but now the days are lengthening. Bring your light to us so that we might see your glory and may work for you, offering hope and peace to this world. We ask this as we worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, children. How are you doing today? I want to share something that one of our friends, William Dahl, gave me. Well, he lent them to me. Um, this is a transformer. Um, his mom actually let me have three. This is an easy one, apparently. This is a harder one. And this one is super hard. Now, if you have ever played with a transformer, they're just really amazing kind of toys. This just looks like a truck that might be sent to help another bigger truck that's broken down. And then with just a couple quick moves, this pickup truck <laughs> turns into something really amazing, kind of like a superhero. It's been transformed. This one, I could do pretty easily. I have to tell you that I had some trouble putting it back together. There we go. And then his mom gave me this one. This is a little harder. I could do it, but I'm not going to do it right now because it would take me too long. And then there's this one. She said this one is probably something for a kid who's 8 to 10 or 12 years old. Apparently, I'm not a kid 8 to 10 or 12 years old because I couldn't figure it out. It took me a long time. Finally, I got it, and then it took me forever to put it back together. Well, I asked if I could borrow these from William, and thanks a lot, William, for letting me use them, because they're the closest thing I could think of to talk about a story that happens in the Bible. In the Bible, Jesus invites three of his friends, Peter, James, and John, to go with him up onto a high mountain. And while they are up there on the mountain, suddenly Jesus looks completely different. He's transfigured or transformed, and instead of looking just like an ordinary guy, he is whiter and dazzling bright, brighter than anything that you could find on earth. And not only that, but then two other men appeared with him. Elijah, who had been a prophet probably 500 
years before him. And Moses, who had been the lawgiver over a thousand years before him, they had long been gone. And they appeared and they were talking with Jesus. And then a, a cloud descended and they heard a voice from heaven, the voice of God saying, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. And then as fast as all that happened, it was over. And Jesus looked like regular Jesus. You know, sometimes we catch a glimpse of the world through God's eyes. Maybe we see a picture of a little child from another country on the TV who doesn't have much food or maybe has some physical issues and suddenly we see the beauty and the love that God would have for that child. Or maybe we see a bird flying in the air and just the way the sun is reflected off of that hawk or maybe that eagle. For a moment we forget about everything else and are just in amazement for God's creation. Well, on the Mount of Transfiguration, those three men were fortunate enough to see a glimpse of what Jesus really looks like, the very Son of God. And the Bible tells us, now we see as through a mirror dimly, like a, a mirror in an amusement park that doesn't show you what you really look like. But then we shall see clearly face to face from glory into glory. That is what it means to you and to me to be a beloved child of God. And remember, God said from that mountain, this is my son, the beloved, listen to him. And so as we listen to Jesus and follow him and do the things he said, we too are changed from one glory into another glory. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for that vision that the men had of Jesus on that mountain, for it shows us what is really real and what heaven and eternity will be like with Jesus. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, kids. See you next week.
Sing it nice and loud. This is from Mark 9, verses 2 through 9. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Sometimes you need a bigger perspective. The perspective of a map versus the GPS in your car, which is helpful, but it only gives one turn at a time guidance. Last summer, Rod and I, for the first time, made the drive up the Woodstock Tower Road, and we climbed to the top of the tower for just such a perspective. It was amazing. The view from the top, I could see for the first time clearly that there really are seven bends in the Shenandoah River right here. And they're magnificent. I could see the size of the Shenandoah Valley. I could see how the town of Woodstock fits within the bigger picture, nestled between the river and the, and the valley to the west. And then far off in the west, you could see the magnificent Appalachian Mountains. It was amazing. And for a moment in time, I didn't think about anything. Certainly not COVID-19 or the world's problems. I just simply stood and looked and was. Mark 9, 2 to 9 gives us just such a perspective. 
We have jumped from Mark 1, where we've spent the last four weeks, to Mark 9 and the Transfiguration, the text that sets the stage for Lent, beginning on the mountain of Transfiguration and ending on another mountain, Mount Calvary. In Mark 8, Jesus has asked his disciples the most important question of all time. Who do you say that I am? And Peter declares, you are the Messiah. And then Jesus foretells his death and his resurrection. But it seems like Peter didn't actually hear the resurrection part because he takes Jesus aside and rebukes him. Surely you can't die, Peter says. And Jesus, in turn, rebukes Peter, saying, this is really harsh. Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Six days later, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up on a high mountain, and for a few moments, they see a bigger reality. It's as if the veil between temporal life and life eternal was ripped open or pulled back. They saw Jesus clothed in dazzling light of God's holiness, brighter than anything on earth. And there Jesus was in conversation with two men who had died centuries earlier, the great prophet Elijah and the great lawgiver Moses. I, I imagine that they were encouraging Jesus for the path ahead, for a rough path it will be as Jesus turns his face towards Jerusalem, Holy Week, death on a cross, and then resurrection. <laughs> Peter, James, and John were terrified. Who wouldn't be? Sometimes the power of such moments are almost more than we can take, and we step back into our head or into action. I think if I had been there, I would have wanted to pull out my cell phone to snap a photo, or I might think, oh, I think it's time to write in my journal, and I think I would have done those things in part to deal with the discomfort of the majesty and overwhelming awe of such a moment. Impulsive Peter, that man of action, not a man of being, gets straight to work and he suggests that they build three tents, one for Jesus, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. You know, I suspect that there was part of Jesus that wanted to remain there as well except that he was perfectly clear about his call. In fact, his temptation in the wilderness clarified that. And I believe in the wilderness, when he was up on the high mountain with Satan, that this was a reminder to him of how tempting it would be to stay there. We all want to memorialize transformational experiences. Just think back if you had a particularly meaningful week at church camp or some other camp or an amazing retreat or a small group that clicked and you were so close to each other. And the very last thing that most people say at the end of such things is, let's have a reunion. But the reunion is never quite the same as the original experience. The Bible tells us that the shadow overshadowed them. And the very voice of God spoke these words. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. For there was and still is much work to be done on this side of eternity. This is the turning point in, gospel, in Mark's gospel. Before this, Jesus' ministry 
was limited to the Galilee, but now he will turn resolutely towards Jerusalem. And then suddenly, the moment is over, and looking around, they saw only Jesus, the Jesus that they'd come to know and love. It's interesting to note that there are two occasions in Mark's gospel when Jesus heals the blind. Just before this text in Mark 8, a blind man in Bethsaida in Galilee is healed. And the other blind person healing is actually the last healing that Jesus performs in Mark. It's blind Bartimaeus in the city of Jericho. And after that healing, Jesus and his followers will begin the climb to Jerusalem and what will happen at that high place. I don't think it's mere coincidence on Mark's part. For the entire trajectory of his gospel, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is not just some miracle tour, but rather it is showing us in glimpses, in snapshots, who Jesus really is, so that we too, you and I, can answer the question, who do you say that I am? Like the disciples, sometimes we clearly see who Jesus is. But more often than not, at least for me, I don't see quite so clearly. I suspect that we all try to hold on to our own vision of Jesus as we want Jesus to be. It's much easier for me to embrace Jesus the baby or Jesus healing a blind person. It's harder for me to embrace Jesus who told Martha that her sister Mary had chosen the better way. For I have an awful lot of Martha within me. And quite frankly, when Jesus calls out the religious leaders of the day, and when he threw over temp tables in the temple, I feel downright uncomfortable. Anger and harsh words are certainly not ladylike, at least that's what my parents taught me. Findleys don't do that. And quite frankly, we don't like it when Christians do that. Jesus ends that whole scene of rebuking between him and Peter with these words. If anyone wants to be my followers, let them deny themselves take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, but those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. Those, those are really difficult words. Jesus' call was to preach and to model the good news that the kingdom of God is at hand. And that kingdom is based on the power of love that defeats even the cruelest of deaths, death on a cross. But it doesn't defeat it through violence, but through the love and the grace of God that trumps everything. You see, we don't get to pick and choose which parts of Jesus we want. We get baby Jesus meek and mild, Jesus the teacher and healer, Jesus the one who burned with righteous anger over injustice, Jesus the one who died on the cross, and Jesus who rose up on the third day. We get all of Jesus. A week ago, I was meeting with us in a spiritual direction session, and my directee spoke of how wonderful it is 
when for a brief moment in time, you have an experience of the holy presence. She said, you know, you want to stay right there so it will never end. I imagine we've all had such times. And that got me to thinking about whale watching in Maui. You're going to have to bear with me as I share a bit about it, because it will make sense. The channels between the Hawaii islands are visited every winter by North Pacific humpback whales who have gorged themselves in the waters off of Alaska during the summer months. These whales, who are some 39 to 52 feet in length and who weigh between 50,000 and 60,000 pounds, make the 3,000-mile ocean voyage in anywhere from four to six weeks, one way. In Hawaii, they mate, and a year later, when the females come back, they will give birth in those waters in Hawaii. I could sit on a beach in Maui and see them blowing. You could see the water spout, and then you would see the magnificent leap as they rose up and then dove back in and their back tail fins just splashed the water. But seeing it was an interesting visual exercise. You see, you couldn't just look at one spot focused on any particular point. Instead, you needed to have what I think of as a soft or a gentle gaze, not one of an intensity, but one of easy attention. And then just sitting there and not really looking for anything, but just gazing widely, suddenly you'd see a spout of water or a head or a breach, and there was the whale or whales. And sometimes you got to see the babies. We've all had holy mountaintop experiences. They can happen any place and any time, and I suspect we all long to have more of those moments. But no matter how hard you try to make them happen, they are pure gift and grace, and not something that we can produce by trying harder and harder or looking more and more closely. We can only position ourselves on the beach and gaze softly and be surprised and blessed when they occur. And in those moments, like that moment on the mountain with Jesus, it is our task simply to be in awe of what we see before we decide what our next task should be. On this 49th Sunday in the season of COVID, when we've let, lost two more persons connected with our church family, the brother and sister-in-law of Bill um, and Janet Seibert, Dick and Barbara. Um, they died together just after arriving at the hospital in New York from COVID. And um, that kind of news and looking at the obituaries every day in our paper can feel pretty overwhelming in this dark, dark winter. And it is imperative, especially at times like these, that we kind of take the ride up Woodstock Tower Road and climb to the top of the tower to see beyond the valley of the shadow of death to get the bigger picture, the eternal picture, the picture that Peter, James, and John saw on the Mount of Transfiguration. Paul the Apostle, for whom our church is named, puts it this way, no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor human heart conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. All of us 
with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror. We are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. And this comes from the Lord, the Spirit. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we shall see face to face. Now we only know in part, but then we will be fully known, even as God fully knows us. And now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, and the greatest of these, is love. It is only by God, whose power is at work within us, that we may be able to accomplish abundantly far more than we can ask or imagine. But we have that power through our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. May we grasp that vision. May it be so. Amen. And please join with me in prayer. Lord of infinite mercy, if we had been present at the transfiguration, we'd have been so busy taking selfies and posting on social media that we would have missed being present with you. We would not take the time to understand its significance for our lives, for we are in such a hurry to memorialize everything that the power and the meaning of the event becomes pale or altered in our memories. Help us this day and every day to look at Jesus with new eyes, those eyes that see him in light of the witness of the ages, that sees Jesus as the one who comes to set all people free, to heal, to bring hope and peace. Help us to be ready to become faithful disciples rather than remaining dazzled by the mountaintop experience. Give us strength and courage this day to witness to Jesus' love by the many deeds of mercy and justice that we can offer in his name. We offer ourselves imperfect but willing to serve. This we pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, you saw the video about Hoffman Homes, one of our mission partners. And if you would like to make a donation to them, they would be happy to receive it. Please send it to the church. You can send it by check and make a note in the memo line that it is for Hoffman Homes. If you want to use PayPal or Realm to do so, just email Becky a note saying that X number of dollars was for Hoffman Homes. And now I want to offer a prayer of thanksgiving for all of our gifts. Lord Jesus, all that we have is yours and all that we are is yours. We ask that you would receive all of the offerings that we give of our time and our talents and our treasures and our lives, and that you would use them so that we might bring your glory and your light and your radiance to this world. 
May all that we do serve you to the glory of God alone. Amen. And now, friends, this worship celebration of the transfigure, transfiguration of Jesus is over. And we are sent into the world to serve that Lord. I pray that as you go, that you would be filled with the love of God, that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ would be absorbed into every single pore and cell within your bodies and that it might radiate out to the world. And that the presence and the power and the peace and the comfort of the Holy Spirit would be with you now and forever. Amen. Amen.